Here we are at uh, BBC North in Manchester at Media City. Um, we're going to be going on at BBC Radio 5 Live um, in about 10 minutes discussing cultural appropriation. I'm going to be talking with someone called Josephine from Black Woman Hair. I feel they're upset when uh, pop stars steal, steal their hair, uh, their styles. So it's going to be interesting to find out how, what that means, how, how, what, you, how, what you're actually stealing, right. see if we can unpack it a bit. Right. It's going to be an interesting yeah. discussion. That's what it's all about. Uh, oh, on fashion statements, a uh, little mix singer, Jesse Nelson. Do you see that picture that she posted of herself wearing her hair in dreadlocks on Instagram? Dreadlocks or braids? What, are you asking me which I prefer? <laughs> <laughs> which was uh, it? She wasn't wearing them last night, though. Um, it looked like... It looked, Distinctly dreadlocky, dreadlockian to me. Um, she's been criticised by some of her followers who think the picture's offensive to black people. Cultural appropria appropriation, that's the phrase. Josephine Otwagoma owns the Black Hair Book, which helps black women find their perfect hair salon. Very good morning to you. Good morning. And we've also got Elliot Locke, founder of the online shop Dreads UK, who thinks it's, it's fine. Josephine, what's the problem with this? Um, I think... She is on the cusp of cultural appropriation. I think she's very nearly tipping over into it. Um, people typically have a problem with um, non-black people or people from another culture who will take on a part of a culture, so a hairstyle or a fashion um Item Sol Campbell was pictured wearing a kilt a few years back. Is that cultural appropriation? Um... It could be. Mm. What about black people who dye their hair red? No, I don't think that's cultural appropriation. Mm. Um, I, cultural appropriation is people who um, applies to people who have typically been marginalised or, um, you know, when you take someone take on a part of someone else's culture and you don't even give credit where it's due. So she if, should have given it a shout. Yes, yeah, she should have given it a shout. She should have mentioned something about the hairstyle. Clearly, she's put the picture up on Instagram because she's changed her look. At what point in the human palette of pigmentation, which goes right across? I mean, we saw from Cheddar Man recently the early Brit who was uh, who was black and had blue 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 eyes. At what point? I mean, are we not just one race, really? Is this not a great message? Because young people will hear people talking about cultural appropriation and will think, you know, that it will make them see difference. So is, is there a point on, on the pigmentation palette, if I can put it like mm. that, that it becomes inappropriate to wear dreadlocks? Um, I think the problem here is that a lot of black people, or uh, Rastafarians even, um, who this is a part of their culture, have not been able to get jobs or not been able to get um, into schools that they want or typically actually just been looked and frowned upon because of the style of their hair. And here um, you have um, Jessie who's putting it on, which is nice. I mean, she hasn't said anything offensive or she hasn't, you know, called it a different name. She hasn't called it anything really. Um, whereas people feel like, well, this is part of my culture and a lot of the times I can't even... You know, represent my culture the way I want to without being looked at sideways. That's a good point, Elliot, isn't it? Hi, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. I think there's a lot in there that we need to unpack because, uh, sorry, is that loud on the headphones? No, it's fine. No, I okay. was just telling Josephine to put her headphones down. <laughs> sure, so okay. she could hear your pearls of wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yes, yeah, so there's a lot in there that that we need to unpack because w what's happening here is is we're we're sort of amalgamating all these issues into one issue, and it's that's going to be a, a problem. So it's probably uh, good to start with with some framework. Um, so the two things that we've got here is one, um, what is uh, dread, dreadlocks culture, where do they come from? And two, um, which is the second issue that's touched on, is, is this issue of privilege. White privilege is often the term that we hear. So let's start with the framework. So dreadlocks culture, are they uh, from the one original culture? Are they black culture? Is black a culture? Um, you know, these are sort of really uh, pressing questions that we can ask. Ultimately, dreadlocks uh, have cultures all around the world. I've just come back from Peru. Um, I'm in the middle of shooting a documentary on dreadlocks at the moment um, that's look at, looking at the cultural narrative of dreadlocks from origin to date and where they sort of spring up from. 
Um, I noticed that Josephine mentioned Rastafarian culture as, as a, a point um, of discussion here. In 1845, Britain took workers from India uh, to Jamaica to work in Jamaica, which uh, it was actually the Indian sadhus with their dreadlocks that inspired the Rastafarian culture. So do we then take that step forward and say, well, have the Rastas stolen that culture from the Indian sadhus? Because they very seldom... Uh, give reference to them is that cultural appropriation and then you know we can go further and sort of say well you know what other things in culture are sort of shared or, or, or passed on um, the other question is that the, the narrative that we have of cultural appropriation is that something's being stolen um, for something to be stolen you need to be at a loss so my question would be what are you actually losing what you're losing josephine um i think for you to be at a loss fine that's fair enough um i think you're losing the visibility of where it comes from um take for example kim kardashian she's recently had um some um she called her hairstyle bow derrick braids now those braids are not bow derrick braids Bo said they were cool Bo liked them yeah he liked them but they're not she <laughs> <laughs> but they're not Bodoric braids, they're cane rows. You know, some people might even call it Ghana weaving. But when you when when you have such a platform as Kim Kardashian with how many millions of followers and you call something what it's not, yeah. everyone's like, Oh my gosh, yeah, this new look inspired by Kim Kardashian, I want the Bodoric braids. Well, it's not Bodoric braids. Is it about white privilege as well? Yes. Well what is white privilege? I mean, the girls abused in Rotherham, they don't know, the white girls, they don't know what white privilege is. You know, the, the young working class white boys who are bottom of the educational heap, they don't understand what white privilege is. It's a, it's a kind of, for some people, we know what you mean, but for some people it's an utterly meaningless expression. And I think that's where people of colour tend to get very frustrated in that it's not articulated, the struggle that black people do face is not articulated and you just have angry black people saying oh this is not fair, that's not fair mm. and, all, and people aren't understanding the story behind it. It's more it. nuanced. So for example, yeah. this is random, but growing up as a child, you, I, you'd have people who got teased for smelling like cocoa butter, but now cocoa butter's all the rage. But, I mean, it was what you did. Um, but now you've got, like, Palmer's and other brands all over the place, and everyone's like, oh, my gosh, yeah, cocoa butter and shea butter and all of this. But it's like we were doing this from dot, <laughs> and no one and we were teased for yeah. it. Yeah, Elliot, last word, 40 seconds. Um, yeah, I mean, coming back to dreadlocks, in, in English and culture... And you've got dreads, haven't you? Yeah, I have. In English culture, we need to look at Shakespeare. Shakespeare refers to the folkloric history that England has of dreadlocks. If you go into Romeo and Juliet, they talk about elf locks. If you look in uh, Poland, in Germany, you've got the Polish plat. It's all folkloric again. Um, and in, in Peru, where I've just come back from, the Chauchian culture from the Baracus period, uh, there's mummies there that are 2,000 years old with dreadlocks. To claim that dreadlocks are from one culture would do... Uh, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Someone takes it here to say, um, learn some history. He Celts and Vikings also had dreads a yeah, thousand years ago. I have learned so much. Josephine, Thank you. Thank if you, you want to know more, get in touch with Jeds UK. <laughs> <laughs> Quick plug. <laughs> I do. I'm going to trace the origin and spread of dreadlocks, starting with their multiple birthplaces in India, Egypt, Africa, and South America. Following their journey through slavery to the Caribbean, and as a cultural export to the Western world. I'm starting my journey in the UK, where I've arranged to meet world famous hairdresser Trevor Sorby, Jeremy Cunningham, bass player from The Levelers, and TV presenter and theologian Professor Robert Beckford. When you have a, a, a hairstyle like dreads, I think you've got to follow it through and you've got to look cool. There have always been white rasters from the origins in Jamaica. First gone because I got really curly, kind of like afro hair. Whether you're Caucasian or you're black or whatever colour your skin is, um, it, it, it's, it's an attitude. The idea of a white rust is no different from saying a black punk. A mouse bedded down in the top of the air. <laughs> it's like I'm trying, trying to be cool, man, you know, and it's like, yeah, it's not working for me. Lyrically, lyrically, calling Mr. Lyrically, Rockney.